ML Commons is a global and open community. We have members from uh, six of the seven continents, and we're uh, always uh, looking for the next uh, member organization from Antarctica. If you have friends down there, please send them in our direction. ML Commons also includes researchers from you know about a dozen universities and research institutions across the globe as well. You know, and if you look back at the origin of MLPerf, it really started as a joint collaboration between industry and academia. And so, you know, this is this is really who we are. And uh, something I'm very proud of is the inclusive nature of our organization. The other, you know, sort of really distinctive thing about ML Commons is I like to say that we're sort of occupy this very unique territory, which is there are a ton of organizations that work on AI and machine learning. You know, there's the partnership on AI, there's uh, the Allen Institute on AI, there's many different organizations that focus there. But, you know, most of them do not do engineering work. And, and even the ones that do, you know, the Allen Institute's a great example. You know, they're really focused on a specific mission as opposed to cross-academia collaboration. And, and, and that really is ML Commons' unique strength. Right. And similarly, there's a lot of open engineering organizations, whether it's SPEC or TPC, both of which were inspirations for us, or, or even IEEE, where, you know, they might do a little bit of ML, but generally they have a broader focus. And so we're really oriented around just doing what it says on the slide, open engineering organization focused on ML, trying to make better ML for everyone. And, you know, we really do that through three pillars benchmarks, data sets, and best practices. And, you know, it all rests on research because ultimately many of the things we start out with start in research, just as MLPerf was once upon a time, and eventually graduate to, you know, being more impactful. Naturally, we're going to be focused on benchmarks today, uh, but there's definitely going to be some discussion of data sets as well. So why are we doing benchmarks? And, and part of it is driving progress and transparency. And, uh, you know, as the Peter Drucker saying indicates, for those of you who work in modern corporations or have, this is the whole idea behind, you know, focals, OKRs, you know, whatever you want to call them. But, you know, once you can quantitatively measure a goal, it becomes a lot easier to improve on those dimensions, right? And the key to me about benchmarking is it's not just a way for vendors to beat each other up, although that certainly happens. But it's about aligning the industry around what it means to be better and what's really important. You know, that comes into selection of benchmarks, that comes into what the metrics are. You know, before MLPerf existed, people would make comparisons that just weren't really well founded and, and certainly weren't apples to apples. But by giving ourselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, both common measures and a common direction to go in, we can go a lot faster, like the folks in this picture. I don't know if anyone here has ever rowed crew. I have not. But, you know, the key in, in the rowing is you need to get everyone on the same beat pointed in the same direction, and then you can fly across the water when everyone works together collectively in pursuit of the same objectives. And so part of what MLPerf is doing is providing those objectives and also at the same time measuring our progress. And so, you know, many of you know, I love to share slides like this. I picked MLPerf training because it's our oldest benchmark. What I've done here is I've taken the fastest closed and available result for each benchmark at each version and plotted it over time against Moore's Law, right? Because certainly as an industry, Moore's Law is what kind of drives us forward. Uh, that is the barometer by which many people are used to thinking about progress in electronics. And I think the real point here is that if you look at how these things are, are going and you look at our oldest benchmarks, um, so that would be ResNet 50 and Mask RCNN, which we've had from the start, you know, the performance gain that we've seen since, you know, the end of 2018, so call it four and a half years, is something in the neighborhood of 30 to 50x, which is incredible. And that's about 10x faster than Moore's Law, right? And, you know, some of the other benchmarks that we added recently, the performance is not quite as impressive. But, you know, if you look at it, you know, we're still looking at 8x, 10x or so for things like BERT and DLRM. So, you know, for me, it's really exciting to get to track this over time. And it's also, you know, really a way for us to show our ingenuity, 
right? Because these benchmarks are so multifactored, right? And so just to remind of sort of what ML perf and benchmarking in general provides, right? Some of this is we want an approach that's fair and community driven based on sort of consensus. And that ultimately brings a lot of benefits. It helps people buy systems more intelligently, think about design choices more intelligently, right? As you're evaluating a feature that you might put in a future ML system, whether it's software or hardware, you know, ML Perf can help provide you with an internal guide. It can help you assess how your compilers are improving. And that's something that it does, even for folks who don't submit. Obviously, we're, we're thrilled to have all of our submitters with us. But one of the things that's really important is because we are open source, because uh, we're very clear and public about our methodology, right? Folks can run ML Perf internally and use that to drive better design of next generation systems, uh, even if they're not submitting. And so there's really a lot of value that we provide to the industry. And, you know, as I said before, ultimately machine learning is a full system problem. And what that means is that, you know, when I'm comparing us against Moore's law, it's not an entirely fair comparison, right? You know, Moore's law measures the improvements that we get in silicon manufacturing, right? But in order to make ML work fast, in order to try to meet the demand that we see that's nearly insatiable, right? We have to pull on all of the levers here, right? We're going to use faster silicon. We're going to use more aggressive architectures, right? So today, you know, sort of the, the most advanced silicon you can probably get is, uh, you know, five nanometers. You know, when we started, we were looking at 16 nanometers, right? We've seen, you know, all sorts of new introductions in terms of architecture, like larger uh, matrix multiply units, different numerical formats. We've seen different algorithms being used. We're actually going to talk a little bit about that today in terms of the training algorithms uh, for some of our new benchmarks are different, right? People are constantly developing new and efficient ways to do some of the building block operations like attention. Right. There's general improvements in software, just making compilers better. And then there's the, the matter of scale, right? Building bigger systems and building systems with more communication bandwidth so that even at a given scale, they're more productive. And last, I would be remiss if I didn't mention data. A lot of people really focus on models, but you know, in a lot of ways, data is the key to ML. And there are data optimizations you can do. For example, uh, something that was pioneered uh, in MLPerf was the notion of pre-sorting uh, natural language data sets in order to get similarly sized data elements together to take better advantage of uh, vector and matrix units, right? That's a technique that was pioneered in MLPerf and widely adopted and is hopefully used in production because it can give you, you know, pretty significant performance gain. So, you know, the goals of MLPerf are up here. Right, we want to be uh, fair and useful measurement, a level playing field. We do look at ourselves as serving both research and uh, uh, industry, and uh, our benchmark results are always reproducible, which is something that is fantastic and, frankly, sometimes hard to achieve in the world of ML. And you know, we're really oriented around representative workloads. And you'll get to see that a little bit more when we talk about some of the changes to the benchmarks. And part of this is that if we pick workloads that are representative, it ensures that when we start optimizing the benchmarks, that those benefits accrue to the industry in general. Especially because our, all of our results are published openly, you can go look at what anyone is doing, find an interesting technique, and decide to put it in production. You know, over time, the MLPerf benchmark suite has, has broadened considerably. We started with just training and, you know, now we've got everything from HPC to Tiny. And, you know, today we'll be talking about primarily Tiny and training. Uh, one of the things we've got that's new in 2023 is MLPerf storage uh, is coming uh, this year. I'm super excited about that. Um, and, you know, that's just uh, spreading the breadth of MLPerf across different domains. And, uh, you know, today we are lucky to have the microwatts, which would be the tiny folks, all the way up to the megawatts on the training side. So I'm going to briefly walk through the training benchmark for folks who are uh, 
not familiar, and I'm going to try to hurry this up because I'm definitely running over time. Just as a reminder, training benchmark, the way it works is we start with a data set. We want to train a model to a target quality. Now, the question of which model you use depends on whether it is the closed or the open division. In the closed division, you need to use a model that is mathematically equivalent to our reference. So, you know, for image recognition, we use ResNet 50 V1.5. Um, that allows for more direct comparisons. And in the open division, you can use any model you want, whether that's just changing up our model a bit or uh, changing some of the things about how you might train the model uh, or using an entirely new model altogether. You know, the metric it is time to train. So when you look at training, it's going to be measured in, you know, typically minutes to train. Um, you know, sometimes it's more than minutes, sometimes it's less than minutes. And to remind folks why we did this, part of it is to really capture all of the trade-offs. Uh, before MLPerf, a lot of people would measure using throughput, um, but throughput has this you know, interesting property where you can do things that boost throughput, like using lower precision or larger batch sizes that may have an impact on your actual accuracy, right? And uh, by fixing accuracy, what we allow people to do is freely vary things like precision, like training methods to make intelligent end-to-end trade-offs, right? A very common trade-off is the larger the batch size is, you may actually need to train for additional epochs. And that's actually sometimes a great trade-off to make. But, you know, unless you look at time to train, you won't capture the downsides of the larger batch size and get to look at it holistically. And so that's an example of how if you pick the wrong metrics, you'll get an unrealistic picture of the problem and, and, and unrealistic optimizations. So, you know, we, we settled on time to train, which is computationally expensive. And that's a really big issue, especially for some of the models that we rolled out here, like GPT-3, which is a uh, notably uh, taxing uh, uh, workload. Time to train excludes a few things like system initialization and model initialization and data formatting. And then and to remind folks on the categories and divisions, and this, by the way, applies to both tiny and training. As I said, there's the closed division and the open division. And then we have three categories of systems. Those that are available today, which means that all of the components are commercially available. There's preview, which means that it'll be commercially available in the next six months. And then there are RDI systems, which are not commercially available today. Some of those may never be commercially available, like a prototype, and some of them might be available in, you know, more than six months. So if you're curious about that, ask the submitter. And then as you look at the results, you know, some of the key things to keep in mind is that uh, uh, you can analyze the results in various ways and look for similarities and differences, right? You know, the obvious thing is let's look at, you know, different hardware platforms, but looking at different software platforms can be very interesting as well. You know, in the past, we had submissions on identical hardware using both TensorFlow and JAX. And part of the point of that submission was to illustrate that JAX, which is a sort of newer and easier to use training framework, is actually fairly performant, I mean, nearly as performant as TensorFlow. Right. So there's a lot of dimensions here that you can look at the results and really dig into them. There's a lot that they say if you're willing to listen. So talking about the MLPerf training benchmark suite. So the, the new benchmarks here are highlighted in green. We've got a new recommender and a new large language model. So the details on our new recommender and our large language model, as well as the other benchmarks are here. Uh, so you can see the data sets that we're using. Uh, the model, and then the uh, target quality that is required for each one of the benchmarks. And just as a reminder, there's a lot of information on this slide, and it'll the slides will be available to you probably a little later today. And so I'm going to talk through the new benchmarks uh, in fair detail to help everyone understand exactly what they're measuring and what has changed. I guess we're going to talk about the results first. So uh, the results are linked up here. Brief sort of summary, we've got 16 submitters. Uh, they're up here. I want to specifically call out three of our new submitters. Uh, I mean, that would be IEI, uh, which is a, a system vendor in China. Uh, CoreWeave, which is a, a cloud vendor, uh, I believe based in New York. Uh, and Quanta Cloud Technology. So all of these are first time submitters and, and 
as many folks from the community can tell you, submitting to MLPerf isn't the easiest thing in the world. So it's a you know, big kudos to them for participating. We're thrilled to have them with us. We've got almost 260 performance results, pretty significant growth over the prior round. And if you look at performance, generally speaking, performance uh, on each one of our benchmarks improved by between 5% and 54% compared to the last round. So that's a pretty, pretty nice showing. Really, really happy to see that. And if you want to take the geo mean of performance improvements, it works out to be about 30%, which again, not bad. We also have our two new benchmarks, the new recommender and LLM. We got three submitters to uh, GPT-3 and five submitters to DLRM, DCNV2. So kudos to all of those folks for tackling uh, our newest and latest workloads. So I'm gonna now walk through uh, and talk about the, uh, the new benchmarks in detail. Patrick Kennedy asked, is IEI a new entrant or a renamed one? IEI is a subsidiary of uh, INSPIR. And by the way, if you have a question, it may be better to ask it verbally uh, rather than on the chat, because it's hard for me to monitor the chat and talk. Dave, sorry to interrupt you. What does geo mean in your perspective? Ah, the geometric mean. So, you know, normally when you think about averaging something, uh, you would, you know, add up all the values and then divide by the number you have. So, you know, add five values and divide by five. Uh, the geo mean, in this case, it's more appropriate. You would multiply the numbers and then take the nth root. So if you have, you know, say five different speed up factors, which is what I was talking about back there, then the most appropriate thing to average them is not the arithmetic mean, but the geometric mean. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you for that. Great question. Quick question before you go. Any new chip vendors? I don't think so, but I thought I would ask anyway. Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Now, there are new chips, but uh, sure. I do not believe we have had any new chip vendors uh, submit to ML Perfect this time. Okay. And, you know, I, of course, I'll encourage everyone to talk to their favorite chip vendors and encourage them to participate in uh, uh, ML Perf. The more the merrier. So the new uh, recommendation benchmark uses the Critio 4 terabyte multi-hot data set, and the reference model is uh, DLRM DCN V2. So we're going to talk a bit about the data set and then the network. But first, why recommendation? What is recommendation? And so, you know, recommendation as a task is uh, kind of fairly generic, right? It's the, the core idea is we have a collection of options and we want to pick the best one. So you know, uh, for anyone who's ever logged into social media, you know, Facebook's been very vocal about this. And then, by the way, they were a fantastic contributor to DLRM DCNV2. An example of recommendation is figuring out what to put in your news feed uh, when you're searching, how you rank items is uh, partially a recommendation problem, uh, what to see next on Netflix, what photos to highlight. Uh, you know, I'm constantly getting reminders from Google and Apple about what photos from my photo reels might uh, elicit particular memories, right? And so this is critical for large content libraries. You know, if you think about Netflix or the number of websites out there, you know, there's no way you can actually look through all of the Netflix titles. So you need some sort of assistance to figure out what's going to be the most suitable thing to look at next to really help make a selection. Online shopping as well is very popular, right? And the key thing is actually, you know, recommendation is highly commercial, but it's also absolutely critical for a good user experience. You know, in a lot of ways, I sort of joke that, you know, the difference between Napster and Spotify, in addition to the fact that Napster was violating copyright law, is the fact that at Spotify and some of the more uh, other similar incarnations, right, you get recommendations. And those might be based on what you've previously looked at, what your friends might be listening to all sorts of things like that. So, you know, recommendation is really a critical thing for the modern era, uh, but oftentimes sort of an unsung hero in some ways. So this is the second iteration of our recommendation benchmark. And a lot of this was motivated around wanting to stay pace with the industry and be more representative, right? Our original DLRM benchmark was a huge step forward over NCF. 
But, you know, when we look at it today, we said that in, in terms of scale, it's not as large as it could be. We wanted something that was larger and more realistic. And in particular, you know, the four sort of critical things that we achieved are listed here. We wanted to use a multi-hot embedding table. We'll talk about that in detail. More compute, higher accuracy, and uh, converge with larger map size. And so we'll, we'll share a bit about how we accomplished that. So we changed the embedding tables to be multi-hot to take into account more characteristics. And that resulted in 5x more memory operation. So, so parts of DLRM are much more memory intensive. We changed how feature interaction works to use a different uh, style of network that's about 5x more computationally intensive. And then we uh, changed the optimizer, right? You know, many people think about uh, uh, training neural networks as using stochastic gradient descent or SGD. Uh, Adagrad is a more advanced optimizer that when it looks at the gradient, it looks at not just the first derivative, but also the second derivatives in various situations to make more intelligent optimization choices and converge better. And then we also switched to using uh, a production grade infrastructure, uh, Portrek, in the uh, reference model. So I, I mentioned this multi-hot data set. And I want to talk a little bit about what that is and how we made changes. As a reminder, our original data set for recommendation was the Critio one terabyte data set. Um, and the embedding tables in that were one hot. And so as the example illustrates, what that means is that if you conceptually think about each row in a database with one hot, it's essentially each row corresponds to a user and one interaction. And so when you do the embedding lookup, you're only getting one piece of information about that user, right? With multi-hot, you now have potentially multiple columns in each row uh, are non-zero and, and represent information uh, about that user potentially. So, you know, the example here is imagine that uh, each column is a purchase. And so when you're looking at a 20-hot instance, you'd have 20 purchases tracked in the history. You would do an embedding lookup for each one, and then you sort of average them all together. And so what this essentially does is it's a more realistic reflection of what people do in, in production, right? Which is, you know, if you think about going back to the Netflix example, most Netflix users have a history of dozens of shows. And so you would want to incorporate all of that user history in order to inform future predictions. So we took these embedding tables and made them multi-hot. And then we also increased the size of the data set by about a factor of four, again, to be more representative. So some of this may be a little bit abstract and hopefully this will make it more concrete. This is the architecture on the right-hand side of both DLRM and DLRM DCN V2. Uh, and what I'm gonna talk about here is how those two things are different. So I've sort of talked at length about how the embedding tables have changed to be both larger and multi-hot instead of single hot. And then, as I alluded, mentioned previously, the feature interaction layer of this network also changed. Um, and so in the second iteration of our recommender, it is three stacked layers of uh, DCN or deep cross network, which you know, based on our survey of uh, uh, large companies that do recommendation is very commonly used. And uh, so those are really the changes. So it's sort of, again, similar top level architecture to DLRM, but key changes in the embedding, the feature interaction, and then the, uh, the training optimizer, we changed to use Adagrad, this adaptive optimizer. And the net result is that we were actually able to improve the accuracy slightly. So for those who are interested for what the deep cross network is, uh, this is sort of a uh, diagram of it. And uh, just a note here that the circle with the dot is uh, element-wise multiplication. And the uh, matrices here are actually fairly large. One of the tricks that we introduced here is that uh, this W matrix that you see on the right-hand side in our reference, we actually uh, decomposed it into two smaller matrices multiplied, uh, which is sort of a common industry tactic uh, for performance optimization that we decided to employ here. 
So, you know, again, looking at DLRM, the key point is we wanted to make it bigger. We wanted to make it uh, uh, both in the memory sense and the compute sense and really adopt more modern computational motifs and techniques. I want to pause here. Does anyone have questions about DLRM? Are you totally confused? Does some of this make sense? You're partially confused. So for all of that, you just barely increased the accuracy. I mean, but you've, you've quadrupled the data set size. Ah, right. So that's a, no, no, that's a really, really good question. So one of the points I want to make is if you talk, look at the details of what we did to the data set, recommendation is actually in some ways the hardest thing to make a benchmark for because, you know, real data sets are impossible to get, right? A real recommendation data set needs information about people and personally identifiable information is really difficult to handle and no one wants to share it, right? Sharing personal information is just, you know, bad karma all around. So what we did is we synthetically expanded this data set. And so the interesting thing is what that means is we took our original one terabyte data set, blew it up by a factor of four, but we haven't added new information, right? So in some sense, the fact that the accuracy stayed the same is shouldn't be too surprising. It, it is a really good question. The other thing I'd point out is that the architecture here that we're using is probably designed for larger data sets than even four terabytes. You know, it's not really public how big recommenders are at most organizations, but there was a paper I think two or three years ago from Baidu saying that their production embedding tables were 10 terabytes. Now that was a few years ago and they've grown since then. So, you know, we're trying to get more representative in, of industry. Like, I don't think we're gonna be able to build something at industry scale, but that is a great question. Does that help you understand the, the nature of the uh, uh, admittedly small accuracy improvement? Yeah, no, okay, thanks, appreciate it. Absolutely. Anyone else? All right. Well, if you do have questions, you know, you can always reach out via email, I'm happy to talk offline, so on and so forth. So now we get to the large language model. So the second benchmark we added was a large language model uh, that works on the colossal clean common crawl data set. We call that C4 because the colossal clean common crawl is really hard to say fast, obviously. Right, and that we used a, a, a GPT-3 model, which I suspect everyone on here has heard of, but we're still gonna walk through it anyway. So first of all, this is our second language modeling benchmark for those uh, who, who are familiar, right? And in fact, it's our third. We originally had a uh, MLPerf transformer in the early days. We retired that and replaced it with MLPerf BERT, which still exists. And you know, now we've added an LLM. And uh, the LLM benchmark is really focused on sort of more generative AI applications, things like chat GPT. And for those who aren't familiar, so a language model essentially takes words as input and then predicts the uh, subsequent output words. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, yeah, Itai is reminding me, we also had GNMT for translation. That was a recurrent neural network in the original one. That is absolutely true, Itai. So in language modeling, some people call it understanding, but I wanna be clear that it's actually really, you know, what you're understanding is sort of the quantitative relationship, right? So the example I gave here is if I say, if I tell you the start of a sentence and the sentence starts with, why did the chicken cross the blank? You know, pretty much anyone here who's familiar with English will tell you that the most likely conclusion of that sentence is the word road, right? That's what a language model does, is it looks at the probabilistic relationships between words, and not just in a sentence, but potentially in a paragraph, in a book, you know, in, in something much larger, right? And so the LLM pre-training benchmark is teaching the model that relationship between the words, right? And so that gets used in a variety of different ways. You can generate essays. Uh, I was just reading a uh, article in Bloomberg about uh, how uh, when ChatGPT came to USC, there were an awful lot of people using essay generation to pass their classes, right? It can be used for code development. Many of you have heard of, you know, uh, Copilot. Uh, there's a lot of startups doing things like that. You can use it for translation, summarization. And actually, it's super interesting. People are using LLMs 
for even things like analyzing the genetic sequence, since, you know, if you think about sort of uh, the human genome as being a bunch of words or characters, it is subject to the same sort of analysis. Unlike words, uh, the human genome occurs in three space in DNA, and that's actually an important thing, but that's a tangential point. So our LLM is based on pre-training GPT-3, uh, the 175 billion model that was originally described by OpenAI. Uh, the paper is linked here, and it's also linked later, I believe. It is a left to right, or what's called a causal language model that is decoder only. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But the key point is because it's sort of working on predicting text, it is left to right for English. Other languages might be right to left or you know up and down, et cetera. And ju just to contrast this to the MLPerf BERT benchmark, BERT is a bi-directional encoder only and is also much, much smaller, right? BERT is uh, 340 million parameters, whereas GPT-3 is 175 billion. So just to give you a sense of size and scope. And then, as I mentioned, we once upon a time had uh, MLPerf transformer, which was used for a translation task, which was an encoder decoder. All right, let's talk a little bit about the data set. Uh, this is the, uh, the C4 data set, as I mentioned, it's 305 gigabytes or 174 billion tokens. Now we are not training on all of C4 because that would take a really long time. And, and you know, going back to some of the properties I said you want about a benchmark, you want it to be representative, but not as long as the whole thing, especially since you know training GPT-3 can take weeks and cost millions of dollars. So what we do is we actually train on a portion of the training data set to create a checkpoint. And the benchmark is training starting from that checkpoint on 1.3 billion tokens. And then we use a small portion of the validation data set to do model accuracy evaluation to tell when you've got the right accuracy, right? So just to give you some rough numbers, this benchmark is about half a percent of the full GPT-3, right? So to be clear, the benchmark's called GPT-3, but this is not a bunch of people who are going out and training all of GPT-3. We wanted to keep the runtime reasonable. But this is by far and away the most computationally demanding of our benchmarks. So the reference model is a 96 layer transformer. It starts with a tokenizer. So uh, unlike the original work, uh, we use uh, the BPE tokenizer. It's not shown in the diagram, but that's the first thing that happens is the network takes in and uh, transforms the text into tokens and feeds that into the rest of the model. The sequence length, which is the long, the largest amount of tokens you can look at, the, the, the window, sometimes people call it, is 2,000 tokens, right? And uh, there are some people who compete on having longer sequence lengths in order to let the model sort of look at more text, but that blows up the computational requirements. And when we set out, 2,000 tokens was a very reasonable choice to make. And even today, it's pretty reasonable that there are some folks pushing the boundaries in that uh, world. But we're using the Atom Optimizer. Uh, again, this is an adaptive optimizer that looks at more than just the first derivative of the gradient and instead selective, you know, looks at the second derivative in some cases. And as I said, we start from an initial checkpoint and then train to 2.69 log perplexity. So that's the accuracy target on about 1.3 billion tokens. So what does log perplexity really mean? If you're doing predictions, like what's the next word in a sentence, uh, that would seem to be fairly straightforward. Did you get the prediction right or wrong for one word? But I mean, LLM is more than just one word. It's generative of like text right. passages. So that is a great question. And you know, you should win a prize because I don't actually know the definition of perplexity. Uh, Itai or Ritika, someone on the call surely knows um, I, what, what perplexity is. Um, so I think in plain language, to understand perplexity is like uh, the likelihood of, an, of the occurrence of a symbol or a token, given knowing what tokens or words have occurred before in your sentence. And like look, taking David's example, why did the chicken cross? So it, it's a probability knowing what occurred before the word you're trying to predict. 
And so what most language models do is they estimate the probability as a product of each symbol's probability given its preceding symbols. So it's like a, given xi, you look at all the tokens until xi minus one and do a product of, the, uh, of those probabilities. So that's log perfect. Okay. okay, thank you. So I think perplexity, I just in looking at Google, it's sort of a generalization of the notion of how accurate your next word prediction is. Right. right? Because right. as you said, right, it, you may not be just predicting one word, right? You might want to generate a whole sentence. But, um, right. you know, I think the key point is this is pre-training. And so in pre-training of a large language model, you don't necessarily know what the downstream application is, you know, for our translation benchmark, which is a full task. We could just say, what is your word error rate translation accuracy? But you could use a trained LLM for sentence generation, for translation, for all sorts of different things. So it's a slightly, um, it is a measure of performance that is specific to pre-training as opposed to a final specialized task. And the benchmark is from the checkpoint trained on a subset of tokens that you've selected randomly and the accuracy is determined on yet another subset of tokens that you're checking and validating against. I just question, so is the checkpoint something that uh, each of the submission submitters would create themselves as part no, of the no, process? No, 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 that's a great question. So, okay, so let me, let me back up and explain. There's the training validation data set. Those are different, right? Okay. So, you know, the validation data set is smaller than the training. And the, the validation data set is what you will use to compute your uh, accuracy target. Now, the training data set, right, is fairly large. I think we said it's on the order of about 170 billion tokens, right? So ML Commons, the organization, that is to say our members collectively, trained the LLM partially to completion and took the checkpoint. Everyone okay. starts from the shared checkpoint. And I the other thing you. I'd All say... Right. You know, when you train an LLM, you train for more than one epoch, right? And in each epoch, what happens is you will see all of the data in a random order. Right. Does I that gotcha. make sense? Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Thanks. So you, you've already created the checkpoint. Everybody starts from that. And and the submission submitters don't have to, to go through that process over and over again. No. Now, I will point out that ML Commons has to go through the process of training to the checkpoint, which is a non-trivial yes. endeavor. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, so, I got you. It, you know, and, and so the, actually one of the things I want to say is I'm actually really, really happy with the training working group that we got these new benchmarks out so quickly because, you know, it, it does kind of actually take some serious compute to even get to that checkpoint. So, you know, it's, it's uh, not a quick process to create a benchmark like this. All right, so, thank you. Yeah, so for those who are interested in what a transformer layer is, I have a little bit more details here. Um, you know, sort of the, the key things that you have in each transformer layer are you have this multi-head attention at the start that's very memory intensive. And then uh, later on, you have your uh, MLP layer or multi-layer perceptron that is very compute intensive. And again, this is gonna be repeated 96 times in our LLM. And the other point I want to make here is the model's quite large, right? Even using a two-byte representation of each parameter, you're talking about 350 gigabytes, right? For the, you know, a, a FP32 reference model would be close to 700 gigabytes. And you need more state to save the uh, optimizer, right? So the gradient of each parameter to save activations. So this is a super, super big model. And, you know, in general, almost most of our other benchmarks, you could actually run on a single processor. It would take a while, but you could do it. And this one, the uh, minimum system size uh, for the reference model is 64 accelerators. So, you know, kids don't try this at home. Uh, you will definitely blow your power main. Um, and actually one of the other things that's interesting about, you know, uh, LLMs, is they're also sufficiently big that in many cases you might need multiple processors for inference. You know, this is not an inference benchmark, but that's just something to keep in mind. One uh, question questions. before you go on. Uh, two questions actually. So yeah. what was the rationale for picking that 0.4% of the entire you know, training set or, mm -hmm. or training period? And then secondly, same thing for the checkpoint, right? Any reason why you picked the checkpoint that you picked? 
Ah, okay. Well, so, I mean, those two, you're essentially asking the, sort of the same question, right? Which is, how did we decide on the specific, we're not training 100% of GPT-3. How did we decide on what portion of GPT-3 we really wanted to do the training? And so, you know, there's a trade-off here, which is we need it to be enough to be representative. And at the same time, we need it to be, frankly, computationally tractable. I think the original OpenAI paper, they said they spent $10 million per run of GPT-3, right? And, you know, part of a benchmark is as a barometer, right? You know, or it's like the Olympics of machine learning, right? But you don't want it to be cost prohibitive. We think it's a really important workload, but we also want to try to be as inclusive as possible. And that means we can't make it so computationally demanding that, you know, only people with the world's top computational systems can show up. And so there is really a, a trade-off we made there. And, and frankly, it was kind of a result of internal discussions about, you know, how much do we need to be representative and what portion of the training, right? Like, you know, we decided that we wanted to capture sort of training to a certain level of perplexity as opposed to training at the start. And part of that is that captures, you know, the execution characteristics for each portion of the neural network are going to be a little bit different, right? When you randomly initialize the weight, the changes in the parameters are going to be bigger initially than they are at the end, um, right? But, you know, I think a lot of it was motivated around getting something that would be reasonably representative of where most of the compute is. Um, Ritika, uh, Ritika is, by the way, is uh, one of our working group chairs. Uh, is there anything you'd want to add to that that I uh, potentially missed? Yeah, I think uh, that was an ex excellent explanation of why we did this and some more detail about, uh, like it was not, it's not a totally arbitrary choice. There were a lot of experiments done. For example, we monitor the, like if you were to visualize with me here, like the loss curve, as you are training through more samples, your loss is decreasing exponentially like, at some rate. So we want to pick a part of the training region where the fall in or, or the accuracy of the loss is following a trajectory, which is like, we don't want that curve to be flat because then how do you determine when do you stop the training? So we want to pick a good slope of that curve where uh, you reach a particular target. And then we also want the region to be some, which allows submitters to run through different batch sizes because different scales of systems uh, would run at different batch sizes. So we took all those engineering experimentations into consideration into picking that exact part of the training region, which will be more representative of what what real workloads would see, would still catch unfairness in like you cannot play some weird tricks to cheat or where the trade-off of the precision choices that you made are more apparent and uh, you still get like representative uh, part where you can see the accurate uh, loss falling down and then you stop when you reach that block for six that that's required. Right, right. I mean, why not just start from random numbers and just assign, let's say, 100,000 or 1 million epochs, right? And whatever accuracy comes, let it be. But, you know, you have at least a fixed number of epochs, right? So that, that's a reasonable question. And part of that is that philosophically, the goal of ML Commons has always been we do training to target accuracy in part because if you don't look at accuracy, then you aren't measuring what customers care about, number one. And number two, it allows people to make trade-offs that are not good in production. And, you know, I will give you an example of that, which is a long time ago when I got started in machine learning, there were some folks who wanted to train using integers. Now, doing integer math is a lot more power efficient. It's a lot easier than using floating point. So if you could do that, that would actually be a tremendous accomplishment for the whole industry. Uh, however, it turned out that when you use integers to do training, you usually will not hit your target accuracy or get even close because you know, the problems of using integers as a numerical representation is just not as good as floating point for this kind of thing, right? And so the quantization that is imposed by integers will basically make your solution not work. And so the issue is if you only focus on throughput and said, hey, let's just do two epochs, you wouldn't necessarily see those problems, right? And similarly, 
when you look at going from FP32 to BF16 or FP16 or to FP8, there are losses in accuracy, right? Or, or potential losses in accuracy. And we want to correctly model those. So I think a lot of it is being honest about saying, what is it trying to be representative of what the customer is experiencing? You know, again, we have to pick a subset of the problem. And so we should probably start, you know, sort of closer to the end and try to hit a target accuracy that we feel uh, is realistic. Because if you back off too much on the accuracy, then you allow people to just really make unrealistic uh, optimizations. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Although I think apples to apples comparison would be more epoch best. I mean, this could be a long conversation and we can talk separately. Yeah. You know, accuracy is unpredictable, right? Number of epochs you do to get to some certain number to certain number. Sometimes you need 10,000, sometimes you need million, you know, depending on the way you are going. No, so that's, that's right. That, so, we, have... we, so one of the things Ritika mentioned that I really want to amplify a bit is we did a lot of engineering studies on this. And some of that is we actually do very carefully look at the number of epochs to convergence and make sure that we know numerically roughly where people should be at. It's something I haven't talked about a lot, but, you know, this is one of the ways where, you know, we end up burning a lot of compute time to make a benchmark and, and a lot of engineering time. And a lot of it is doing these studies to understand the, you know, how the accuracy changes epoch to epoch, because in general, it should be fairly predictable. If it's not predictable, in full disclosure, one of the first MLPerf benchmarks was NCF, and it was a recommender, and it was not numerically stable. Half the time, it would not converge. And making a benchmark out of that was super painful, and we had to like do a bunch of things in the rules, and that's one of the reasons why we replaced it as quickly as we could. And you know, most of the models that are out there and the numerics are designed to be relatively stable and predictable, but that's part of the engineering analysis we have to do behind the scenes to be confident to, to like to green light a benchmark. Uh, and we'd be happy to talk about that offline. I do want to yeah, shift yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll to stop talk here about because, our yeah. friends from Tiny. Correct. Uh, so they, they know they are not being forgotten, uh, even though everyone's really excited about GPT-3. But this should just be a motivation for all of our friends in the embedded landscape to see how quickly they can run GPT-3 inference. So I'm going to briefly uh, run through the Tiny benchmark. It's, again, pretty different. Um, it's really focused on, uh, you know, ultra small devices, really low power that, you know, may not even be running an operating system, you know, at the milliwatts or microwatt level. So we're talking about really small models. So the four benchmarks that we have are uh, shown up here, keyword spotting, visual weight words, anomaly detection, and then uh, lightweight image recognition. Uh, and you can see the number of parameters here you know, is not so much measured in billions, but thousands, right? Um, so these are pretty small, compact models. For those of you who are familiar with MLPerf inference, this is single stream only. So what this means is that the way we measure performance is we submit one query to the system and measure the latency for getting it back. So this shows the benchmarks in MLPerf Tiny. We have optional energy measurement that we did in collaboration with Embassy. And you can see what the reference uh, networks are here and the target quality. You know, and again, we are trying to pick target qualities that are reasonably representative given the data sets. One of the biggest limitations for all things in the world of machine learning is getting good data sets, and it is really hard. This is what Energy Runner, the Embassy Energy Measurement Tool, looks like. Quite nice UI. Kudos to the folks at Embassy. So this time around, we have actually a bunch of new submitters, seven new submitters, Bosch, C-Tuning, FPGA, Convnet, Hai Jiang. Uh, who I believe is a student uh, or a researcher at Shandong University in China, Cry, Nuviton, and then uh, SkyMiser is a uh, new uh, submitter as well, and they worked in conjunction with Nuviton. Hey, hey, David, there's a just like TensorFlow Lite versus TensorFlow and, and things of that nature. I mean, are you yes. allowing them to use whatever frameworks they mm -hmm. wish? So they use TensorFlow Light Micro or TensorFlow Micro. David, you want me to feel that? Yeah, one? hit it, Jeremy. <laughs> so the reference implementation is uh, TensorFlow on the computer and then a TensorFlow Light runtime uh, for inference on the microcontroller. 
but submitters are allowed to use any framework they want uh, for the inference runtime on their device, as long as the model is mathematically equivalent to the reference model. So that's sort of the same rules as in MLPerf training, right? You know, for training, the reference models tend to be TensorFlow or PyTorch, but you are allowed to switch it to whatever you want uh, that is mathematically equivalent. And the same is true in Tiny. Uh, and that's in closed division. As I said, in open division, you know, do whatever you want. That's okay. there for people Thanks. to do really innovative stuff. So we got a lot more results, more submitters, more power measurement, and much wider participation. This is from our uh, fantastic working group, Sherek Shaba, and shows the performance uh, over time of both the reference and best sort of submissions, I think. Yeah, best inference speed re compared to reference. So, you know, right now we're seeing submissions that are, you know, just a thousand times faster or so than the uh, reference, except for anomaly detection. Looks like our best result was back in version 0.1. And then we're excluding, uh, it sounds like we're excluding some of the Raspberry Pi results. Yeah, I can add some some disclaimer on this figure. Uh, sure. Yeah, so you, you do see a lot of ethnic scale there, which is which is which is very nice. Uh, so obviously, such a figure comes with with lots of disclaimers. Uh, what you should know about Tiny is that it's a large span of devices that that we are including uh, at the end. So, for example, in the in the first version, uh, version zero point five, we had uh, the reference implementation, but we also had a, a submission from uh, on a Raspberry Pi four, which is is clearly a, a larger device. It was useful for us to show that the, the benchmark can be adapted to different things, but it's not really a microcontroller, it's not really a small device. So, so I was excluding it from, from uh, this figure. But for example, I was not excluding things like FPGAs, which we have now in the benchmark on which we don't have energy measurement. So, you know, you could look at these in, in, in different ways. And also, I think it's important to note that the the reference implementation was on, on something which at the time was kind of already something already settled and, and widely available. Uh, it was a Cortex M4, uh, which I think came out 2010. It has no AI specific anything, and it was running uh, TensorFlow for light micro, so a generic framework. Uh, and what we have now is, is more bleeding edge. So we have hardware acceleration, we have software acceleration. If you just look at improvements on that specific Cortex M4, uh, M4 uh, based MCU, uh, you would see four, six times in improvement, just software-based improvements on results compared to the original reference implementation. So you look and look at it in, in different ways, but we, we, we do see huge improvements. Uh, it is not the improvement in the industry in those two years. Uh, clearly, it's, it's, it's on a larger time span. So this curve will flatten out, unfortunately, uh, as, as we have more submitters and more of the industry are, are, are submitting. But yeah. Uh, that was huge improvements in, in the last years. Thank you, Shaba. Appreciate the call. Shaba and Jeremy are the chairs of the uh, MLPerf Tiny Group. Oh, and Anton, Anton raised a good point, which is that the ResNet in MLPerf Tiny is a very small ResNet. It, it has just eight layers. So, you know, again, thousands of parameters, not millions. All right. So that brings us to the end.